Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's Creative Placemaking webinar, Under the Hood. We're glad to have you with us. My name is Frederick Sindel, and I'm a program associate here at Enterprise, supporting our culture and creativity work, along with our Green Communities program. And I'll be your host today. Just a few logistics before we get started. We're looking forward to your questions, and you can submit them to our panelists at any time by using the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll be pausing at several points throughout the session to address questions, so type them in as you think of them. As it says here, please direct your questions to all panelists, which should be the default. Most of you are using the streaming audio, and it usually works just fine. But sometimes local conditions can cause interference. If that happens to you, you can switch to a phone line for audio. To get the dial-in numbers, click on the little circle to the left of the red button on the bottom of your screen. Once that menu opens, click Audio Connection, then switch audio. From there, follow the prompts and you should be able to call in. We will be using video in this webinar. If you would like a full screen view of your presenters, click on the full screen icon on the upper right side of the video area. Hitting the escape key will bring you back to the regular view. When you leave this event, you'll automatically be taken to a quick survey. We'd love to get your feedback. This event will be recorded. We'll be sending a link to the archive to all of today's participants within the next couple of weeks. Today, I'll start us off with a brief introduction to enterprise and the climate and cultural, um, the creativity, uh, cultural and creativity programming. Then I'll hand it over to our moderator, Maya Sharfi, who will have a conversation with Annie and Mark. For those who aren't familiar with enterprise, we are a national nonprofit in the housing and community development field. We invest in the design and development of high quality housing, but we also know that housing alone isn't enough to connect people to the resources and support they need to build healthy lives and experience upward economic mobility. This is why we also invest in strategies that build local capacity and uplift residents' voices in the development process. Research and experience have shown that uh, investing in cultural expression and creative processes can lead to important community development outcomes. It can strengthen trust and make communities more resilient. It can benefit the local economy and build community wealth. It can also contribute to a built environment that honors and reflects residents' voices and vision. Since 2000, Enterprise has invested in the integration of design and creativity into community development starting with the Enterprise Rose Fellowship Program. This program has been an opportunity for designers and creative practitioners to bring their skills to community development. Annie and Mark, who are with us today, are alumni of the Rose Fellowship Program, spearheading creative placemaking at their organizations. In 2010, we added the Design Leadership Institute, which helped expand our reach by bringing developers and designers together for a two-day long design charrette. This led us to establish our Collaborative Action Grant Program in 2013 and launch our Climate and Cultural Resilience Grants in 2017. This year, for the first time, we added a culture and creativity focus to our Section 4 funding. With Kresge's support, we've had the opportunity to invest in grantees, staff, and programming that increases our understanding of how culture and creativity help us meet our mission to increase opportunity for low-income residents. We have a number of blog posts and resources on our website. Early in 2019, we'll be releasing some publications that have examples of creative placemaking in case studies and actions. We'll share that announcement with everyone who registered for this webinar when those are available. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Maya Sharfi, founder of the design research firm Creative Agency. Maya is a thinker and a doer in social impact design and creative placemaking, and she is one of our creative partners who has worked with us to develop some of the existing tools and resources that you can find on our website. We invited her to join us to moderate a series of conversations about the integration of culture and creativity and community development. Welcome, Maya. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm very excited to get into today's discussion because one of the questions that we get asked all of the time is, how do we fund creative placemaking? 
We hear about it from artists. Artists want to know, how do I get hired to do this kind of work? And we hear developers talk about it, right? You know, how do I find ways to integrate this work into the projects that we're working on? Now, I want to say first that this conversation goes both ways. Um, please be listening actively, thinking about the questions that you have, thinking about how what we talk about here today shows up in your work and in, in what you're trying to push forward in your community. So please do not be shy. If you have any questions, use that Q&A box that Frederick talked about. Don't ask your questions all at the last minute. Ask them as they occur to you. And if anything resonates with you, please feel free to type something into the chat box and let us know this is working. This is showing up in my world. Oh, no, this is how it's showing up in our world. Now, um, today, just as we get started to get you feeling comfortable using that chat box, I want everybody to take a minute, um, everybody who's um, watching as well as listening, um, put in the chat box, what is one question that you would love to get answered today? Right? If this webinar could move you forward, what's one question you'd love to get answered? All right. Now, while you do that, I want to introduce you to the fabulous panelists that we have today. Um, so first, I want to introduce you to Annie Ledbury. Annie is a licensed architect and a community developer who brings tactical urbanism, arts, culture, design, thinking, and health into affordable housing and to place-based community engagement processes and projects. You're going to get to hear about those today. Um, she's based in Oakland. Welcome, Annie. Hi, everybody. Glad you're here. All right, and I'd like to introduce you to Mark Mattel. Mark Mattel is, a Rose, is, the, is the Rose Fellowship Director at Enterprise Community Partners. Mark is an architect, developer, and creative, and his focus is to provide economic and housing opportunities through the lens of design and creative placemaking. Welcome, Mark. Hi, everyone. Okay, so as, um, let's, let's dive in um, as folks are um, sharing why they're here today. Um, so, Annie, I think I want to start with you. Um, why don't you walk us through the creative placemaking project that you're going to share with us today. Um, we, as, as um, Frederick mentioned, we're really going to get a chance to see the project and then to dive deep under the hood with you of how we pulled it off, how it got, how you pulled it off, how it got funded. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Um, let me just share my screen. All right. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of background first about the project itself. Um, how do I get rid of this? All right. Um, so this is our site, uh, and we um, <clears throat> so we acquired this site in 2015. You can see this building right next door is a beautiful historic hotel, um, former SRO um, that we also own and operate with some beautiful ground floor commercial. Um, and there was a liquor store on this site when we acquired it right next door, and it has this kind of parking lot with it as well on a really major corridor um, in West Oakland, California. Um, and yeah. So um, this is kind of our vision for um, what the building will eventually be, um, and this grew out of a lot of, kind of work with the community uh, and kind of development of the project that probably sounds very familiar to lots of you. Um, but we started that process by looking, um, really asking folks what they wanted to see in this spot. Um, it had been a liquor store for generations, um, and it was, you know, it's hard to picture what could be there. Um, and so we made this kind of 40 foot long sign, worked with some a local artists and some youth to make it, um, and put it up on the fence. And it was up for about four months. Um, we did two rounds, and uh, the themes that we started to see coming out of it was um, really just there's a need for stores, um, places to shop. There's not a lot of um, healthy food available. That was a big theme as well. Uh, restaurants, places to gather, um, jobs and services play, um, just places to be together in open space, arts and culture, housing and learning. Um, and so then we kind of set out to come up with a temporary um, intervention that would bring those things to the spot um, in the meantime while we were working on uh, the planning, fu funding, financing for the affordable housing building. So um, 
This was the vision. We worked with David Baker Architects um, and some other folks to come up with this vision um, and to really detail it out and work, work with the city to, to get it implemented because um, they never had done a pop-up temporary permanent two-year-long um, event space like this before. Um, so we you know, had to push against policy. And then 2016 in November, um, we uh, opened, had our grand opening of this beautiful space. So it has six vendor stalls. Um, it has kind of a, this is a sitting area. Uh, it has kind of an amphitheater and places to perform music uh, and lights and infrastructure to hold uh, up to three food trucks. Um, and as a result of this work, um, the ground floor of the building next door, which had some beautiful commercial space that was vacant for kind of perception reasons, um, we were able to attract tenants. And right now I'm working on the build out of um, the, like a TI design for the ground floor that will be an anchor, um, a, a blues cafe. Um, we also have uh, rented out the liquor store space to uh, a local recording label with a really amazing Grammy award-winning artist from the neighborhood, Fantastic Negrito, um, and also um, the Oakland Public Conservatory of Music. Um, so they're partnering together on this amazing new restaurant. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about the background yeah. of the project. So um, now let's roll up our sleeves <laughs> and, um, and Annie's going to take us under the hood of this project, especially financially, and to understand how this project was budgeted, how the budget of this project works, right? At the end of the day, that's what made this all, one of the things that made this all happen. So let, let's dive right in. Yep, um, so no more pretty pictures. <laughs> um, let's look at the real stuff. So um, I'm just gonna share with you today kind of a summary that brought together the languages of a couple different departments um, in my organization. So we're a pretty large organization. We have a develop, real estate development department that kind of um, works on large new construction projects and then also um, renovation projects. So um, I was kind of that middle person um, translating between um, the folks running the programs, doing the community engagement, coming up with the vision, um, the artists and the youth interns that we worked with, um, and then tying it all back to how we can actually get this funded. So I'm just gonna show you in those couple of different languages first, um, and then how it all came together. Okay. Um, so this right here is just um, the relevant pieces of our pro forma for it's a um, our four percent pro forma. Uh, that oh, and just just in case there's anyone out there who doesn't know what a pro forma is, want to give us just a really quick definition? Sure. Yeah. So essentially, it's all of the sources and uses. So it's all of the money that you need to put into a project. Um, usually, it's a big real estate development project, um, and all of the things you're going to spend that money on, and then a lot of pieces that go into that. Right. Um, it's kind of the developer's set of, if you're an architect, it's your set of plans, right? This is the set of plans um, in the language of a, of a developer. Um, Great, and, thank you. Yeah. And so um, this, this piece, and you'll see it a little bit later in Mark's, because he's going to show you a, a big hefty performa. Um, this is kind of the highlights that really overlapped with what we needed to know as the placemaking project. Um, so a lot of it has to do with just holding costs. It has to do with, um, you know, paying the taxes while the site mm -hmm. is empty and, those, and putting security fencing, putting lighting, mm -hmm. um, you know, all these things that we would pay for even if it was just a vacant lot or a vacant mm -hmm. building. Um, and so it's already built into the budget because it always takes time um, to get these things going. So these are just some of those things. And then uh, an important part around pro forma is, is when do you need that money? Because mm -hmm. It's the whole process is, do you need it right when you get the, the property? Do you need it um, to kind of build out your design and pre-development, come up with your plan, get approvals? Um, or do you need it later in the construction and permanent financing? Um, and so we started to kind of pull from certain spots, um, especially right here around um, community relations and outreach. So we started to think about, um, like, rather than just having a few workshops, which is kind of what we're required to do by our city, um, that we could spend that money and use it in a, in a new way. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the real estate development language. Um, 
And then we also received, so early on, when we were just looking at the property, we hadn't even acquired it yet, we, um, we wrote a grant to kind of fund this whole project, and we were so lucky to receive a million dollars from the San Francisco Foundation, an anonymous donor of the San Francisco Foundation. Um, and they, that funded both the purchase of the property, um, which as we develop it, we'll roll that money into a new property. So this is hopefully a revolving um, thing. And also the build out of the, um, the temporary uses and some of the operating for the temporary uses and the programming to bring that okay. in. Um, so that's, we were really lucky to have that upfront cost, especially because this is the first time we were doing this. And mm -hmm. we, we didn't really know all of the costs and our, the city didn't know all of the costs either. How do you even mm -hmm. do that? Um, so these are the kind of relevant pieces. So my role was to really handle the, the um, development of the pop-up infrastructure. Um, there are okay. other folks that were um, really working on the, the soft infrastructure around supporting the tenants, or the, um, there's kind of the micro businesses and um, other softer things. Um, and so that's, but this is kind of all of the, the funds that it took in total. Um, so I was yeah. really working on this piece, the big. Um, okay. All the physical stuff. Um, there's the timing and then all the um, little ugly Will you go back pieces. to that just really quickly just so that we can see? So, so this project included tenant improvement and capital expenses, so 142000 Community design process was 20 k Neighborhood events, 10 k Internship stipends, 10 k Project supplies were 7 k So just to get a sense, you know, all of this is adding up. And this doesn't include, um, it doesn't include land the land cost right that's that's separate right yeah right so, totally. yeah. Right. so okay just to get a sense of, of you know how what this is composed of and the different proportions of money that are going into different kinds of uses okay keep going Andy. Exactly. um and i just threw in a couple of so this is kind of all of the invoices that we spent just to give you the sense of there's a lot of things that we had to buy and keep track of and okay. um and that was just that went into this piece yeah um, okay Got so it. Um, and then we also have like our property management folks, so speaking their language and pulling in. So they dealt with utilities, kind of the day-to-day -day things um, that all of that had to come together. So that's this, and this is the last one I'll show you. Hopefully this tells Yay, the whole, the whole story. Hooray, <laughs> um, so this really brings it all together and simplifies it down to, okay, so what is everything that we needed? We, we need both to start this up and to run it until we're ready to break ground on the, the family affordable building. Okay. Um, so, and it projects into the future. So this, we were making this um, because we also had to fundraise for operations um, okay. beyond that startup cost. Right. Um, and so, you know, you gotta think about, you know, Things like porta potties and things like mm -hmm. the the water bill and property taxes, mm -hmm. um, and we had to to get to this number, which is so. Just to explain this a little bit, so the paid by Lester, this is the real estate development project, okay. um, and and the pieces that they paid for. Um, then we had the startup operations. That's like the really cool tents and the twinkle lights and some of the startup, like the art materials that were in the closet to do activities that we could buy with that initial big grant, um, but, and some staffing as well. Um, but then there's the things that, especially as we evolved this process and we learned that there's, we're gonna need more, there's more expenses that we're gonna need beyond the startup costs. So we, then we got a sense for fundraising what we could, mm -hmm. what we would need. Okay. So, so and then hold, the it, hold together for us a little bit, right? So now we're seeing this this full project, right? There's the development of land. There's you know the property management. There's also um, linking on what the third tab was, but um, or the second tab was. Um, oh, it was the the tenant fit out and all of those other components. So mm -hmm. where tell us about the whole project budget and where that money came from, right? Definitely that startup grant was a big deal, but what else was involved? Right. Um, so the build out of kind of the the space was all covered by that um, by that initial grant. But then we also started to think about how are we going to fundraise for this piece, right? So this is the part we were missing, um, the marketplace manager. So the staffing ongoing um, and the event costs ongoing were kind of a big one um, because those weren't covered kind of in the normal course of business with the development right. project. And, um, and, and let me just also interject and say, you know, I think this is um, this is key, right? Because it's not just oh, we have the infrastructure for a pop up. 
we like you also have to run it and operate it right like that's that's not nothing right that's not it's not let's not make that labor invisible <laughs> yeah no it's definitely labor um and and we want to make sure people are being compensated fairly too yeah. um because you know the folks running these programs they work really hard so um, and this is just for the, the remaining amount that we had um, for how long we projected for the project to last. Okay. Um, and so we started thinking about um, other sources. So uh, originally the liquor store space, we had built it out and we were using it for meetings, kind of a community space, a temporary community space. Um, but over time we realized that we really needed the income from that space. And since we had already done a little investment, um, then and we had this mission of bringing arts and culture in a more permanent way um, when we were only using it like two nights a week and it was mostly a vacant building. Um, so then we decided to rent that out to our um, the recording studio. So now we're getting some of this amount covered by the income from them. Also, they're partners in the programming, um, so that's less for us to have to do to, to throw, to, you know, rally musicians for every event because they provide right. that as part of their lease. Right. Um, oh, that's great. Is that part of the terms of their lease? Yeah, so that's been a really great tool for any of our our um, commercial projects that are socially motivated. We often, mm -hmm. I mean, we we think about what is going to be a good fit for the neighborhood, the vision, mm -hmm. um, but then we also think about um, affordability rates. So a lot of times mm -hmm. we can we can say we need to have a you need to have a meal that you offer for five dollars or less. Mm -hmm. um, that so it really welcomes and includes people in wow. that commercial activity, and it's a powerful tool for that, and it's sim pretty simple. Um, Sounds and, like a win-win. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and then we've just been continuing to do fundraising, but having a, a clear picture of what our needs are has really yeah. helped in um, in yeah. being specific about that to our, our foundations and other grant makers. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so so um, if you are listening and you've got questions, right? I'm sure there's all kinds of things you're curious about about you know under the hood of this project. Please submit them. Mark, as you're watching watching Annie roll through this, um, having worked on a project that you know is, is actually in some ways very parallel. What's coming to your mind? Um, it's this. It's how complex it actually is. Um, there's you know, what's, what, what Annie is really showing is really the nuts and bolts of things that. You know, when we're putting these projects together, uh, then you have to consider making sure that you have like electricity um, and sort of the safety that's involved, uh, uh, permitting, which is sometimes ghosted costs that a lot of people don't see, uh, and 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 certainly also aspirations of the development team, which was making Annie mentioned, making sure that people were being compensated for wages, uh, and those things are you know challenging to to a restricted budget, if, especially if it's mostly uh, grant funded or uh, you know, donations. So those are just the levels of complexity that sometimes just goes like over folks' head when they're putting together a, a budget like this. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, and you know, Annie, I mean, that that big grant was huge, right? This couldn't have happened without that big grant. But I know that your organization can't rely on another one million dollar grant to do the next version of this. So how are how are you thinking about that money as the kickstart of a process that then has some of its own momentum. Definitely. Um, and so part of that is reflected in the design of the infrastructure itself. Um, and so, you know, all of these, these tent structures that are out there, I mean, they have four foot foundations, which is kind of ridiculous for a piece of scaffolding, construction scaffolding, but, you know, it's very safe. It hasn't blown down. Um, but it also is held in by pins. So it's kind of just an off-the-shelf construction scaffolding system um, that is pinned to these foundations. So when we're ready to roll to the next site, um, in theory, when we take our, our acquisition funding out with a construction loan, um, we can then purchase a new lot with that those funds essentially rolls over, and then we can actually unpin the, the infrastructure and move it to another site with um, not nearly as much cost as the original. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not, it's not free to do that, but it's, um, it's yeah. much less than the original. Um, and also thinking about a sustainable business model for the market, like a lot of this is social infrastructure too. So having, um, you know, a perception of place, having a system for cultivating these micro tenants, uh, you know, every single event we have different folks. So even though they're all from within, you know, a very small area and close to our 
our site. Um, but that's uh, that roster and that um, relationship building is also another kind of infrastructure that we mm -hmm. we did, you know, we've invested in that already. And it's not that much harder to just give a new address <laughs> to those right. folks, even if it's no infrastructure at all. Even if it's just you roll the food trucks over here, um, you know, that's there's definitely an investment there that um, will continue as long as we continue to nurture it. Yeah. So what you guys have really done is you've you've actually kind of, you know, bitten on to the front end of your typical development process, right? So you acquire the land and now it's actually part of your process to say, it's going to take some time before this land gets developed. And in the meantime, we've got an economic development engine and that, you know, we've got the physical infrastructure, but also the social infrastructure and those things, especially that social infrastructure grow over time. Mm -hmm. And our new development process is actually that this is the first part of our development process for at least one site that we're working on at a time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to switch over to Mark. Um, so um, if you have any questions, again, throw it in the, um, throw it in the, in the Q&A because, yeah, this is your chance to ask these brilliant people questions about, about the ups, the downs, and the everything about what they're doing. So, Mark, tell us a little bit about your, your effort that you, work, you worked on. Cool. Um, thanks, Maya. So, I'm going to talk to you guys today about a project that uh, I was previously a project manager for. So, uh, this project, I was actually one of the uh, original Made with Love grants. Um, in that book that Frederick showed earlier. So my relationship with the organization, which is uh, Nuestra Comunidad uh, Development Cor Corporation based in Boston, was uh, the PM and Rose Fellow for the Bartlett Place project. Uh, and I, re I left there in 2000, the latter half of 2016, and have kept a consulting relationship with them uh, over the past two years. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the project that initiated uh, um, sort of a placemaking and a permanent fixture onto the site. So it's, uh, and then today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we are potentially funding the project after what we learned from the temporary events. At, um, so just for a little bit of context, um, uh, this is the site that we hosted the uh, temporary events called uh, Bartlett Events, and it's an 8.5 acre bunch yard so you can sort of get a scale uh, based on the image below that is uh, sort of cut out of a hill uh, um, sort of surrounded by a residential neighborhood um, in the city or neighborhood of Roxbury. Um, and so initially the idea for the project was to have a temporary plaza uh, work as a community engagement tool to help inform what the permanent plaza could look like in the development. Um, so you can see here that originally the uh, temporary plaza was going to happen in the um, front of the site. Uh, and then eventually as buildings start to uh, move into place, this temporary plaza, similar to uh, what Annie's uh, uh, proposal was, would move along um, around the site and eventually ending up as a permanent fi fixture. And along that process, these community events, and you can see the three images here, uh, examples of some of the events we hosted in that summer uh, would inform what activities would actually happen in, in, in the final uh, piece. Um, and so a lot, all of these were community engaged uh, and community led efforts. Uh, you can see here sort of a, a small um, uh, retail space, uh, art making, and then sort of a public festival event that's all community led. Um, and we wanted this to help identify the project even before the project started. That way it was owned by the community and uh, sort of led by the community and can be informed of what the, pub, the final place would be. Um, and here you can see other examples. I think this website is still active of activities that happened throughout uh, that summer um, when we hosted one of the events. And during, during these events, I would go out there um, to use as a community engagement tool to talk to our neighbors uh, who wouldn't typically attend um, community meetings uh, in the evening, I mean, mostly because they had, you know, one to two other jobs uh, that they were taking care of. But this was, you know, when we brought a model to the site to talk to them about what was happening, um, the events that could potentially take place in their neighborhood. Um, and we got a lot of positive feedback. We got a lot of um, comments from neighbors that we hadn't met before. So this was definitely something that really helped shape the identity 
of um, the project. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I moved on from the Western CDC, but since uh, since uh, that's taken place, two of those buildings are already in place. So you can see up here that original building, uh, which is uh, 60 units of affordable housing, um, a rental and market rate, um, and a, a local market rate grocery store, which will be critical in the budget that I'll show you. And then the home ownership component, which is on top of the hill looking onto the public plaza. Um, and that public plaza now, since I've left, has sort of taken a, a new, uh, new ground. Uh, in, in this case, is being developed and designed by Mass Design out of Boston and a local group called Oasis at Bartlett, which Nuestra CDC put together as a uh, as a consortium to help bridge together what was uh, captured in the Bartlett events uh, activity in the past. And so this is just uh, a rendering and a conceptual idea of what the permanent fixture could look like. It's, a, it's essentially just a frame that could re be reinterpreted in multiple uses. Um, so right now where the project stands is that we, that we what Nuestra CDC is in, is in the process of um, answering the budget for this to be built. What I'm gonna show you is conceptually the, uh, what Annie showed you was a pro forma. What I'm gonna show you is a operating budget, which is typically used to generate how the building would actually uh, what money you need to have that's generated from the rental units in order to make sure the building is operating um, fairly. So here it is. As Annie said, there's no more pretty pictures. We're going to dive right into the numbers. And this is what I call hacking the budget. Um, and this is something that needs to come from the development team. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to be the project manager for the for this site. And so I was able to essentially reinterpret things that typically that you would find in an operating budget uh, that could help fund uh, creative placemaking and that can help should help actually program that public plaza that you saw earlier. So um, one of the advantages that we had in this project was, as I mentioned, we had market rate units and the local groceries. So at times those, uh, those buildings, um, uh, not buildings, but uh, units and um, grocery store would be paying into sort of an amenity package okay. uh, so that there would be uh, like a component where they would, you know, be able to see activities within their state. So typically this is one that of what is generated uh, per month. So 2000, at the course of a year, it's about $29,144,000 as a budget to be able to use for uh, activities. And then we have miscellaneous uh, revenue here, which is sometimes generated from um, like a fundraiser or sort that's held within the building or renting out a space within the building. Um, mm. So those are options for us to be able to use for actually instead of just specifically for the project, in this case, Bartlett Place was this specifically designed to have that public plaza be that amenity mm. package for the entire site. So portions of this uh, budget are actually going to fund um, the public plaza, and that's critical because that's a piece that you need, that you intentionally need to be able to put so that there's a constant revenue stream to be uh, placed. And in this case, it's at a amenity membership dues premium, and I'm going to break it down on how those were allocated. Yeah, um, yeah great. And so one of the tricks is using uh, landscape expense. It's something that's you know specifically when you saw 8.5 acres, the landscape is going, the landscape budget is going to be huge. And it needs to be maintained. So in uh, the design of the project, we ended up using landscape that was like the public plaza instead of an actual just sh trees, shrubbery. It was a public piece that could be reinterpreted. So the maintenance of that is included within this budget, but also uh, workout equipment that was sort of laid out across the site actually that helped to generate activity and, and health options for the tenants, but also you know, this needed to be maintained, so we were able to up our uh, landscape uh, expense because of incorporating those components within the design budget. So this is where design and budget sort of marry, and we're able to uh, insert it so that it actually generates uh, some uh, revenue from the rent in order for you to pay for the uh, cost. Um, and these are some of the general things that you would 
as you can see, nothing here is highlighted in blue because this is some of the general components that you need in, to maintain the project uh, as uh, the building operates. And all of this is generated from the rent. Um, in this case, uh, this is other things that, are, that can't be, that are needed to simply just operate the building. And sometimes there isn't a place for us to be able to hack it. Um, so in this case, uh, as you can see, the, in the conceptual budget, the net operating income to operate the building per month is $72,000. Um, and in that piece, I'll show you what we can extract in order to make sure that we can get, actually activate the public plaza. Mm -hmm. um, so in here, uh, this is a page taken out that's inserted so that it informs the numbers in the last budget that I showed you. So in this case, we're taking $120 a month from oh, public investment. Uh, Mark, will you actually zoom in as you go through this when you show us the kind of blue, the, the blue half zones, will you zoom in to the page? Is it, uh, is it? Okay, Do maybe one here. more little, two more zooms. Yeah, that's great, okay. Okay, so here's one for parking reimbursements, um, which is sometimes when people come onto the site, uh, you can charge for parking and then you're able to generate revenue from there. So in, in this case, we just made an assumption that we would have 17 parking spaces for the entire site, which would generate $120 uh, per month. And so instead of using that for maintenance of the building, we're gonna use that for public events to help fund it. Um, $120 a month, you know, adds up over a course of 12, year, uh, 12 months and, um, I know we'll, we'll find bigger chunks as we move throughout the budget. Um, as I mentioned, the exterior landscaping ground maintenance, the annual, the annual fee just to, to, to maintain it is 17,500, which is mm -hmm. higher than most because again, we, we included that as part of the major budget component for the public plaza and the workout equipment. Um, in this case for security and life safety, fire safety, window washing, these are some of the things that we need to help operate the building, but we are not, we are not hacking this part of the budget because this, there's nothing here that we can um, okay. address. I'll show you okay. some other ones that we were able to find. Hold up. Uh, here's one. Um, so what, one of the pieces that we, uh, that you have to do in order to, to, to stay competitive with market rate is to actually advertise. Um, and instead of using the advertising budget to go on billboards, websites, uh, well, you know, some websites and, and um, um, magazines and flyers, we're actually using the public plaza it, as itself as an advertising component. So when mm -hmm. events are held there, we advertise for the units of vacancy uh, in that area. And so that generates and is pulled from the rent about $3,100 um, uh, for the year. So there's there's some pieces there that, you know, like small interventions could, you know, don't take that much to fund, like a small art installation for a month could be less than $1,200 to just pay artists and um, materials. So that goes yeah. in, that's a, a small piece. Um, let me go to the next one. And here, because we were in the, the Boston market, our marketing and advertising budget was a little bit more. This may not be the case for where you are uh, located based in your region, but in, in Boston, in order to stay competitive, there are a lot of other areas that we need to be able to advertise. And it's, and we're pulling what we'd normally allocate for those areas and putting it into public events advertising and using the public plaza as an event, as an actual advertising component itself. Um, and then generally within Roxbury, there's a lot of community events that are held public meetings. Um, that building just happened to have a community room that we're able to rent uh, on, on a monthly basis. So we, in this yeah. case, we, we thought that it probably be rented at least three times a month and that yeah. we'd be able to pay $5,000 a year. And this could change uh, if you rent out the community space for other groups. And, you know, with a public plaza nearby is definitely something that could, people could take advantage of. And it's, uh, and with the public plaza itself generating revenue, for people who want to hold events. So Mark, I want to pause you just for a minute so I can kind of pull together what, what I hear you saying. So I hear you saying it was a market, it's a market, it's a building that includes both market rate and affordable housing. And as a result, the funding stream of that market rate revenue is something that we can do something with, right? You know, I know, and you'll, I'm sure you'll talk about this a little bit more, but there's oftentimes a lot of funding restrictions on um, 
the money that goes to support affordable housing, and there's many things you can't do with it, but because your building includes both market rate and, and affordable, um, subsidized affordable, then um, you're able to, to kind of tap into that funding stream. And then second, second hacking tip I'm seeing you, you share with us is that there are all these places on a budget, a, a, a development operating budget, which could, could, some of them need to be what they are, right? You know, fire safety, this and that, right? But some of them, we can actually ask, what are they meant to do? Could we do this differently or better with arts and culture? So, you know, public events are advertising, yeah, put something in a magazine, or what if your site itself and what happened on it, the design of it, the activation of it is the advertising that you need in order to attract attract interest in this property. Does that feel right? Like I like what you're... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do want to, I do want to see one piece where we I just want to make sure it's clear even though we have an affordable market rate component the amenity package is benefiting the entire the entire complex it's not just the market rate units who stay yeah. to benefit and we're pulling the income from it's a, it benefits the whole it's just because of the layers of funding uh, due to to LIHTC state uh, compliances there are just certain things we can't pull from those budgets and so we pull them from the market rate units and again, the notion for that is to stay competitive in making sure that we're off in market rate units, there's an right. amenity package that's competitive to somewhere else like downtown Boston that you right. may want it. But if you could have a, a concert in, at your, in behind your building, you know, every yeah. once a month, that's something that's provided for you for free and it's being generated by the income. Um, Maya, if I can just jump to one image. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. going to backtrack. Absolutely. And just to put it, the budget back into context of an, of an image, um, I want you guys to look at this because I'm only showing you a budget for two buildings uh, right now, which is this. So this four smaller diagram shows the completed project in, uh, in its inception. So essentially one, two, three, four more buildings will be adding back into this budget mm -hmm. to fund mm -hmm. public plazas. So it's, again, it. once again, it's, one of you, it's intentionally designed and funded so that you're not fundraising, you're not going to certain, no, you're not going to our place, you're not constantly having to look for fund. It's being funded mm. by the opposite of the budget. And that was intentional. It was because we wanted to make sure that this was a place uh, where created place making when it was tested becomes a permanent picture. Um, and it starts here in that early phase of like designing and developing the budget, but it takes like a group like Oasis, um, Bar uh, Oasis Bartlett to sort of continue that that energy. And again, I'm yeah. excited to see what we do it next since I'm physically removed from the project at this point. Yeah. So with okay. This, I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. This is great. This is so great. And with. So, and I think, Mark, you've lined us up perfectly for a question that we're getting from someone who's listening. So, they're, okay, well, they're asking, what's the best way to communicate the benefits of creative placemaking to an affordable housing developer within the real estate project development cycle? So, I think there's actually two pieces that, to that question, right? Where within the real estate project, project development life cycle are there opportunities for creative placemaking? And I'm hearing from Annie this approach to pre-developing the site. I'm hearing that pre-development that, that pre development work um, activation from you, but then we're also seeing from you, there are all these places where you can attract tenants and, um, and leverage um, the budget within the project to um, the operation of the project to keep that happening and to build a sustainable funding stream for that. But so Mark, what, you know, if you were going to communicate to a real estate developer, other than yourself, um, what the benefits were of doing it within that real estate life cycle, what would you say? I, I would say you should look at what's happening around in your city and what's, what are people gravitating to the, for, uh, I would say, to get their cultural fix where, you know, to go out on the weekend, what concerts are they seeing? How can I bring that to our development? Because if there were okay. commercial pieces in the development, that's, that's marketing traffic. That's those are clients that could come and visit that commercial piece or leverage you to make sure that you don't have any vacancy because there's this great place that, that you're right behind that you can actually uh, live and see without having to go into a diff different part of the city. It's actually in your neighborhood. 
So okay. to approach a developer, I would I would talk to them about the benefits of of leveraging both um, uh, reducing your vacancy rates and attracting okay. uh, foot traffic, which is important to developers. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then I think um, we're getting this other question, which I would like to um, put towards Annie. Annie. Do you have any advice on the best practices to include com community members in the community design process of a creative placemaking project like this? Take us a yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, definitely a big one. Um, so we did a lot more than just the sign. I think that was a really nice visible first claiming of space for people. Um, but we also did a lot of work um, in embodying that in the whole process. So, um, and we did this also in parallel with a kind of tra more traditional uh, kind of series of, work of design workshops with, um, you know, led by the architect about the, um, the building that they wanted to, you know, that would come out of it as well. And having some of these more um, social, we were able to test out some things with the space. Um, we had one whole event that was just about libraries and what should the modern version of a library be. Um, thinking about like what if that there was some ground floor use that that served those functions as well, and could that sink into the design of the building? Um, and so we have this kind of beautiful lush entry courtyard that will have um, programmed things happening in there in the long term, tied back. So we it, it's part of it is still tied to the community design process for the building, uh, but a lot of it is you know, people taking ownership. So we also had this in parallel with our small resident-led creative placemaking project. So the playground of this marketplace was actually um, part of a larger, something else, another program we do where we have individual people take on a project um, and they really dug into that play piece of this marketplace. Um, and worked with a volunteer designer um, and came up with this whole beautiful ground painted hopscotch and scooter trail that's like part of this marketplace. You didn't quite see it there, but come visit us and you can see it um, with a tetherball and all these um, you know, kid amenities um, that will inform the playground design for the final building. Um, but so having folks not just um, tell you what they want, but involving them deeply in the production of um, what does that look like? What does mm -hmm. it feel like? And then occupying it and telling us, did it work? Like, is this, mm -hmm. is our kids playing on the scooter thing? Turns out that they like the tetherball way more. <laughs> and the scooter's got lost. And so, okay, so that's a lesson we've learned. Um, but yeah, continuing forward, um, we're just trying to see how, and then the arts and culture piece, like, that was super resonant. Um, and hopefully, some of these tenants, um, these folks who are just selling hats that they make in their house or quilts or barbecue. Um, that's how we found our tenant for the barbecue cafe is he was doing a pop-up. Um, yeah. and, 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 you know, we've gone, we've met so many amazing local vendors um, that having some of those pieces and like what really sold and what resonated with people who live there, um, mm -hmm. like having some of those things be baked into the permanent, um, you know, both the programming and the design of the building. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so Mark and Annie, I think there may be people who are artists who are listening. So, you know, you kind of opened up the hood, showed us the budget and where this happened. If you were, what advice would you give to an artist who wants to do more work in the community development realm but doesn't know where sh where to get started? Who do you want to go first? <laughs> Um, you know, why don't you go for it, Annie? Um, so I would say, um, so art it is not just something that um, you put on the top of another project. It's not an extra piece. Uh, I would encourage artists to identify and listen to what, you know, if it's affordable housing developers or others, what they want to get done, what are the problems that art can solve, and then show through your craft how you can be of service to that, whether that's through community engagement, through, you know, some piece that you can create, something like a physical thing that can really, like if what they're trying to do is get community input or get attention, um, you have to kind of speak both languages. And I think uh, learning a little bit about what those other languages are can help you make that case better. Because, um, yeah. yeah, definitely, if you can make the numbers work too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and one, 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 oh, just one thing I want to throw out there is that we're hoping also, I mean, we know that there are real estate developers who are listening to this and trying to understand how might I shift our process, but also we're hoping for any creatives or culture bearers or artists who are listening, you feel like you have a little bit more of that language now, having watched Andy and Mark go under the hood. So yeah, Mark, what, what, what do you think? Um, well, I'm going to just cycle back into that question, uh, just to chime in there for a second, um, is that maybe as an artist is attending your local community meeting, or in, in this case, maybe a larger city meeting, um, mainly because I will say that some developers are opportunistic. Um, and, uh, you know, when there is support shown for a development, I think as an artist, that's something for you to be able to leverage. Uh, specifically, this is an example on our project, uh, we were targeting to actually use artists as subcontractors to help build parts of the building, which like a railing or uh, some of the benches that would be going onto the site. And those opportunities aren't really available unless you're aware of some of the projects that are happening in your mm -hmm. area. Again, it's a, it's a long-term relationship because the de developments don't happen after two months. Uh, you know, it's not I just like a small insertion. There's, it's a, it's a long-term game. So building that relationship is attending those community meetings. And I would say a, there's a certain level of assertiveness that needs to happen about approaching and asking like, asking them critical questions like, oh, how, how are you uh, infusing art within this part of the development? And he, that developer may not be thinking about that. And, it, and, and some developers you may not know would be open to those ideas. And it, it, it is sort of approaching that, that through, it, through that lens is uh, really sort of my perspective. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So I want folks who are listening, we're, we're going to close down in a few minutes, but I want folks who are listening to take a minute and to think about one takeaway that you want to take with you out of this, out of this conversation, one learning that you want to take with you. Type it in the chat box. All right, so I'm actually going to, as we close up with Mark and Annie, I, I want to ask each of you um, the same question. So, Mark, what is, what is one takeaway that you're taking from what you heard today or from Annie's project? Um, let's start with you first. Um, well, I think what I like about Annie's project is that there was a, a critical piece that was thought of way beforehand outside of the budget, which was they knew that in order to make this work and try and replicate in another location, there had to be an infrastructure that was developed uh, in order for it to be able to move so that in the case that this was, and in this case it was successful, that they wanted to try it, they're ready to deploy. So those pieces are not going to be added to the next budget because they're already, they already have it. They have the infrastructure mm -hmm. and can be used and replicated in another piece. Um, I know that that's something I, you know, forgot, <laughs> like, like just adding back into a project. And that's really interesting that that's a piece that is what she really highlighted uh, both in the budget and also visually into the project. Yeah. Annie? Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so I was really inspired by the whole concept of the, the mixed income development because that I think is a new frontier for a lot of affordable housing developers in uh, difficult to develop places. Um, and so we have a few of those projects um, and are moving forward with those partnerships with for profit. But um, and and if we're, we're not the ones holding those decisions or those operating budgets because we partner with a for profit. Um, how can we make this case and build, bake that in now because that's when it needs to be and if it's not us holding that, um, but if they're socially aligned with us, then it's time. Right now it's time to ask, right? So, um, yeah, and also just what are the other sources because affordable housing needs this work too um, and yeah. Yeah. not everyone's going to have magic million dollar grant right on them. So how, um, how do we continue to, to really build out that business plan so that it's sustainable? Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. As we close up, what I want to pull together that's so interesting about both your efforts is that, you know, there is, there's funding, right? There's, there's the million dollar grant in Annie's effort, right? There's, and there's going out of your way to include a much more vibrant um, community 
engagement process before the development with Bartlett events. You know, I, I, I realized, because I, it's, it's there all the time, my um, desktop background in my computer is Bartlett events because it's so vibrant and bold and beautiful that <laughs> it's like I want to be reminded of that, especially, especially in the winter. Mark probably didn't know that, but it's true. Um, <laughs> but there's also this focus on finding these sustainable funding streams, right? So how can this project then how can it become part of a revolving door? How can the operations cost fund arts and culture? How do we think about, you know, Mark, you didn't talk about this um, and Annie, but the people who we hire to operate the building, is there a way in which arts and culture gets brought in in the way that they do their, their job um, and do their work? So while you may not have a million dollar grant, um, you know, maybe you're sitting there thinking like, okay, it worked for Annie and, and her organization. What I want you to remember is that every time a precedent of a project gets created, right, every time a project succeeds, it creates a precedent of that, that says, wait a second, this is doable. So, you know, if you're putting together a big effort and like, go to your funder and say, hey, this is what they did in Oakland. I think we can do this here, right? This is what they're doing in Boston. Can we take even 10% of this to our next effort, right? One strategy that they use. Let's see what we can do with that. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for going, telling your story and going deep on the, under the hood with us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And um, thanks, Fred. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a really great conversation. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, if you're interested in this topic and loving this webinar format, uh, be sure to check out the Creative Placemaking webinars by LISC and the NEA. Um, it's located on their events page at lisc.org. Um, I went ahead and posted this in the chat box so you can all see. Um, and with that, it's time to conclude today's session. Um, new Rose Fellowship positions will be opening in February, and this application cycle will be open to architects, artists, and culture bearers. Also, a big thanks goes out to our panelists and everyone who enjoyed us today. We hope to see you again at our next Creative Placemaking webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.